is a story with many facets. Varied twisting side channels lead to the central core and current. Often it is considered a city story. But this is a misconception, for parts of it frequently reach into small towns and villages. This is a story of a problem that knows no boundaries. It spreads beyond city limits and county lines. It crosses state borders without discrimination. And parts of it stretch past the boundaries of our own nation into the vast intangible areas of other countries. Thus, part of the story is here. And sometimes seemingly disconnected, apparently having no relation to other parts of the story, Another facet may show itself here. And another side may be here. And still another part here. Yet as seemingly independent as each episode may be, they all lead toward the central theme, toward one end. Hooked. A monkey on her back. Hophead. Junkie. Hype. There's no shortage of words in the jargon to identify her. They all add up to the same thing. And she knows better than anyone what they really mean. The end of the world. A fix, a few grams of narcotics, is the sole object and purpose in life. But this end must have a beginning. Somewhere between this room and... And here, the stage is set. Beyond, the ideas, the drives, and the emotions that will lead toward the end are molded. But in the beginning, God created man in his own image. Strong and sound in mind and body. And the body begins to grow. And the mind takes form and learns. But sometimes there are defects in the pattern of learning. Errors, misunderstandings, and many times, negligence. Young minds and emotions are held firm by love and a picture of security. They cannot understand the complexities of life. It is the duty of the adult to introduce these complexities with a careful teaching hand. They must always remember that reason is the gift of adulthood, which youth has not yet learned. Youth feels life just as they see it, and they react to those feelings. Thus, now a problem has taken root, and a beginning is established. No single incident makes a problem. They are born of many errors. Mother! Mom! Sorry I won't be able to get home for dinner again tonight. Forgot about the club meeting. Plenty in the refrigerator father called. He'll be home next week. See you tomorrow. Mother. of loneliness, and these hours unfold into days, weeks, months, years, in which the young mind probes and experiments with life. Youth is hungry and eager to grow into the cherished dream of adulthood, but left to itself, that growth is unchanneled. 
The adult tools are available, but without the guiding hand to teach their proper use. To the young person, the mere use of these adult tools symbolizes the arrival into the grown-up world. A dream world where dependency is ended and loneliness can be conquered. And they find they can make their own decisions despite inexperience and hide their lack of security. And adding appeal to the situation, the unsupervised adolescent playing the make-believe role of adult easily finds companions to join in the game and perhaps introduce new rules. playing a clandestine game, there is likely to be one or two who have advanced into even more forbidden areas. Bigger kicks. Drugs. Narcotics addiction frequently follows a pattern of gradual addiction to different drugs. Often the introduction comes in the form of a goofball. These are barbiturates. Ones in common use are seconal, nembutal, and luminol. These are legitimate medications when prescribed by a physician. He understands their use and potential dangers, especially to those who may have an allergy toward any or all of them. Here, an untrained youth dispenses them to persons about whom he knows nothing. Barbiturates are sedatives and hypnotics with depressant effects. To help offset the sedative effect, barbiturates are sometimes taken in conjunction with amphetamine such as benzedrine and dexedrine. These are opposites, and the body fights to remain normal. Instinct or a natural fear of drugs may inhibit the user in making the initial experiment. But those adept in their use of drugs understand this fear and make a concentrated effort to break it down. They may comfort or deride the novice. But whatever the method, the purpose and desire is to bring another member into the illicit fold. The situation is expanding. It is no longer simply a family problem, a community or social problem. Although it is all of these things, it is now also an enforcement problem. Not only for specially trained agents, but for every field officer. Narcotics are associated with a wide variety of crimes. Robbery, homicide, burglary, vice, and morals. The annals report that over 75% of all crimes today are in some way motivated by drug use. The symptoms of barbiturate addiction are slow, confused thinking and defective judgment, emotional instability, lack of coordination in walking, tremors and involuntary oscillation of the eyes with the inability to hold a fixed position. What's going on here? The question that must be answered is why this situation arose. Yet, like too many parents and other adults, the attack is on the symptoms, not the cause. Primary attention is on the condition of the house, the material loss, the opinions of neighbors. The tirade storms on without sympathy or understanding, thrusting cruel barbs into already opened wounds. But this time, the barbs have been dulled. The pain is eased. The goofball has won a friend. She has found a crutch to see her through her difficulties instead of facing up to them and coping with them. The goofball worked. 
And in time, she may be ready to try something different, something better. Jive, marry, grifo, grass, hay. Technically, it's cannabis sativa, a common name, marijuana. It grows four to 20 feet in height. The fruit resembling seeds appear at the tip. The plant is cut and the fruit and vegetation in this area is used to produce a narcotic cigarette. After the plant has matured, it is topped. That is, the usable portions cut off. The leaves are then stripped and dried. Drying is generally done under the eaves of a building or a similar area where the heat will be intense, yet not in direct sunlight. The marijuana leaf, the long slender fingers pointed at both ends are characterized by the serrated edges. Tiny hairs and resin on the leaf make it sticky to the touch. On the underside, a central vein runs up the middle of the leaf. Smaller hair-like veins extend out from this central vein to the serrated edges. This sticky resin is gelatinous in nature and is the cannabin, which is the narcotic of the plant. The leaves always have an odd number of finger-like blades, numbering from five to 13, appearing on each mature leaf. The flowering tops shown here above the leaves have their own distinguishing features. The tops appear in a cluster formation enveloping the fruit or seeds. These tops are the portion of the plant most desired by those in the illegal traffic. An established connection in the suburbs. A rendezvous prearranged by telephone. A narcotics user is often very wary and suspicious. His primary concern, second only to desire and his need for the drug, is his fear of detection. Marijuana has various stages of preparation. The rough stuff is usually bought in kilos, two and two tenths pounds. It has a value of about $125 to $200 per bulk kilo. Sometimes the raw material is packed in pound quantities and sold for about $60 to $90 per bulk pound. An innocent victim of this racket is the ordinary tobacco can. Both brown wheat paper and regular white cigarette paper are used to roll the sticks, joints, or reefers, as the cigarettes are often called. The matchstick or nail file is commonly used to tuck in the ends of the cigarettes after they are rolled. The premium part of the marijuana plant is the flowering tops. These consist of a cluster of leaves that enfold the seeds and contain the essence, the condensed cannabinol. The tops packed in a tobacco can have a wholesale value of about $15. It will finally produce 60 to 75 cigarettes, which sell at about $1 each. When the marijuana has been topped and dried, it is ready for the final preparation, manicuring. The leaves and other dried matter are rubbed into fine pieces. In a careful operation, all stems, seeds, and other rough matter are removed, leaving only the pulverized leaves. Even in this final stage, marijuana is easily recognized. Its texture and greenish color clearly distinguish it from tobacco. The cigarettes are usually rolled in a double thickness of paper. This prevents rough stems from piercing the wrapper. This is especially important since they will probably pass through many hands before reaching the ultimate user. The ends of the cigarette are tucked in to prevent the loose, dry contents from spilling out. 
The finished product, the reefer, one dollar's worth of poison, and an unmistakable piece of evidence that can be easily distinguished from an ordinary cigarette. Now the contact is complete. The buy is made. Major crime is mushrooming on an officer's beat. Yet, unlike other crimes, there is no victim who will enlist his aid and call his attention to the crime. This marks the peculiar nature of the narcotics problem. He must detect the crime as well as the criminal. Observance of inconsistencies is an axiom of good enforcement procedure. A new car, expensive clothes and lodgings linked with a person of no apparent income indicates possible illegal activity and warrants further investigation. Unlike a tobacco cigarette, marijuana does not have burning agents. Therefore, constant smoking is required to keep it lighted. For effect, the lungs are first filled with the smoke. Then a final mouthful is taken and inhaled with air. Some smoke is swallowed. It is held in for as long as possible to get the maximum effect. Sometimes the cigarette is held slightly away from the mouth and with deep inhalations, smoke and air are sucked in at the same time. Whatever the method, the novice must be taught. Often a few drags will produce a toxic effect. The effects are unpredictable, appearing generally similar to overindulgence in alcohol. But the subject may become dangerous, and inflicting wounds may even seem comical to him. Inhibitions are relieved, and the user is extremely susceptible to suggestions. Delirium, increased imagination, hallucinations often follow. The eyes dilate. Dimensions and depth perception are greatly affected by this drug. A single step may appear as a cliff. Activity is usually cautious and studied. perception is impaired by marijuana. Time seems to fly, and fast action seems slow for the addict. The seed of a major problem is planted, and with the rise of the sun on each new day, it grows larger, like a silent cancer in the community. The problem festers beneath the surface thriving on silence and secrecy. Admittedly, the task is not an easy one for the uniformed officer. It is basically a task of detection. Wait up, man. You want to get high? Johnny's got some pot. Shut up. There's heat in here. There's a vast collection of words peculiar to the narcotics trade. The field officer who makes himself familiar with his jargon can quickly sense the atmosphere and undertone of a situation. While he has nothing concrete, this officer knows he has heard narcotic slang. Through the natural course of familiarizing himself with a new element on his beat, he is approaching the core of the silent problem growing around him. The former owners were an old couple who operated a quiet, pleasant teenage hangout. The place to meet after school or have a malt after the movie. It was a place where the officer had friends. Now, changed. A wild beginning. A place to watch at any rate. He must not reveal his suspicions. The evidence is slim and inconclusive. But with his attention focused toward possible narcotics traffic, he can be alert for further indications. 
casual exit through the rear door leading to the parking lot will provide the officer with a complete picture of the new malt shop. The changes should be observed both inside and out. The pusher on his rounds casually awaits the customer's signal to make contact. The inevitable question of the user, are you holding? Both addict and pusher protect each other even though they exchange no mutual respect. Each depends upon the other, and so they cooperate. The buy is set, and the pusher must get to his supply casually without any obvious act. In this case, he moves away simply to remove the sticks from his cigarette pack. Even the most casual observation is feared. Anyone could blow the whistle, so play it cool. That is the basic idea behind all transactions. The money has been placed between pages of the magazine. The page is dog-eared. The pusher changes cigarettes for money leaving his merchandise inside. The connection has been made. They've scored. The users, the heads, the tea blowers hurry off to use their buy. Frequently, a user acquires his marijuana by pushing the drug himself. According to the records, one user will introduce five newcomers. now go to a place where the tea can be smoked with relative safety. The spot has already been chosen, one used before with success. A dead-end alley, safe from the danger of observation even from casual passers-by. Windows are usually closed and a confined area used. This both prevents the distinctive odor from drifting out and preserves the precious smoke for its maximum effect. One reefer at a time is usually consumed by a group and a non-user could become contact high from smoke. With the officer's suspicions already aroused by the jargon he has heard, he takes this opportunity to make further observations on the suspect. Marijuana addict, unlike most other narcotic users, prefers company when smoking the drug. Thus, tea parties and getting high together is a common event for them. Nothing unusual, a car parked in an alleyway, a driver and two passengers. But to the officer whose suspicions are already aroused, there is something unusual. On a warm, sunny afternoon, all the windows are rolled tight shut one distinctive mark of a marijuana party. Even as the tea party progresses, the young pusher awaits more customers for his poison. They know where to find the pusher. This customer, though, is not an addict but the girl to whom the pusher introduced the weed. She is still a novice, 
but has found marijuana more gratifying than the goofball she was used to. And sometimes she will use them in combination. Typically, she comes now burdened with depression from another family argument. She searches the new means of escape has shown her. She wants one now, just one. She's way down. He knows the feeling, not a physical need, but a mental craving. The misery of not having a crutch. The novice must be schooled in the finer points. Care must be taken in choosing the place where marijuana is smoked. Not only is the method of smoking peculiar to the drug, but the odor is unmistakable, similar to burning alfalfa. At night, it is distinguished too by the fact that it burns much brighter than an ordinary cigarette. Not a cash deal now, but a few more samples and she'll be ready to buy. A regular customer. She was advised that her safest move is to join the tea party. The investigation should not be obvious. Passers-by and others in the vicinity must not be alerted. At least one partner must be enlisted to make the actual investigation. Marijuana addicts are often dangerous to handle. Then, too, narcotics cases are difficult to prosecute in court. A second officer can corroborate evidence. The wary and suspicious attitude of the narcotic suspect makes apprehension difficult. The drug must be in the possession of the suspect. Thus, even a few seconds warning may be enough to allow them to destroy the evidence. plan is laid out. Signals are established. Move fast. Get the evidence. Eliminate all avenues of escape. The hands are the primary concern. Many narcotic suspects will attempt to destroy evidence even after capture. If possible, hold the hands until they are examined or cuffed. Order the fingers extended with palms up. Before taking the suspect from the car, establish that the ground is clean. Anything that falls there now is his. Watch for any fast move to discard evidence. It is a trick of the narco suspect to carry drugs in a pocket with the bottom cut out. When he stands, the evidence falls to the ground where he displays it. Handcuff the narcotics prisoner with hands behind and palms out. This hinders any attempt to get at evidence hidden on his person. And in the case of the heroin addict, it prevents him from scratching or burning needle marks or scars. Once cuffed, the suspect is searched for weapons and evidence. Establish evidence before the suspect as it is found. A wallet must be examined in full view of the prisoner and all money and valuables removed, counted, and returned to him. Before the second suspect is removed from the car, the driver is restrained by placing him in a temporary window pillory position to avoid attempted escape. The officer obtains his partner's handcuffs. The suspect is then brought out with his hands held. Special care must be used in shaking down this suspect, since two prisoners must be watched by a single officer in the act of searching. The suspect is cuffed and searched. Again, evidence is established before the suspect.
Match packs should be opened. A roach, a marijuana butt, is often hidden behind the matches. The third suspect is brought out, keeping her arms outstretched and hands open. Tell a woman suspect that she will be searched in jail by a matron or physician. Advise her to produce any drugs she has rather than let them be found by search. Frequently, a woman will surrender the drugs when her position is clear. Make the warning strong, emphasizing that she will be under constant surveillance until the search is made. Narcotics are often secreted in body cavities, especially by female offenders. The suspects must be removed from the vicinity of the car to allow a shakedown. One officer guards the suspects, taking maximum precautions against possible escape. Look immediately for more evidence in the car. Search hubcaps, under seats, in and around the engine inside light fixtures, the horn and steering column, and all areas under the dashboard. Check for special compartments as well as standard cavities, regardless of size. More detailed search, especially under the car, can be made on a garage lift. An officer's careful attention and understanding of narcotics has led to the arrest of suspects. It will not end here. For narcotics offenders often talk freely, and one arrest leads to another and still another. There are those who escape. With them, they carry the problem like a germ, perpetuating it. But where do they flee? In this bizarre crime known as the narcotics problem, there is no real escape. Thus, continued use of marijuana can lead to brain deterioration. There are only endings. And each of the endings is lonely, silent, black, and terrifying. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Just give your immediate reaction. Answer which best to save each of the scenes. Well, what if I think they're all LSD? Then? This was one of many such groups with whom I'd met. Parrots seeking an answer. Their common bond was fear. It was reflected in papers. The scenes they had watched all suggested LSD. And this is our culture's anxiety. We have a growing number of parents who think or know that their children are using LSD or are afraid they may be tempted to use it. Now, let's take another look at these scenes and see how they compare with our answers. What are we going to see now? Most of you thought this was an accident caused by the use of LSD. Some of you even thought it might be a suicide. It was drugs, but not LSD. Her doctor gave her some medication with a warning not to drive, but she thought warnings were for other people. Nor is this a suicide induced by LSD or anything else. You might argue about who killed him, the enemy, the society that sent him to war, but one thing is certain, he didn't kill himself. The exotic party with dim lights has nothing to do with LSD. It's one of those desperate suburban affairs where everyone uses alcohol to escape his inhibitions and anxiety. You could almost smell the incense in this one, couldn't you? Well, there isn't any. It's a school dance with adequate supervision. in the ambulance? Yes. This one is LSD. A bad trip. There's no question we have reason to view with alarm. But four times out of five our fears are groundless. We're being victimized by alarmists and sensationalism which causes us to look at the world in a distorted way. Times of rapid change produce anxiety and escape from anxiety. And parents have been put on the defensive by neighbors, the police, teachers, all of whom equate long hair or being different with drugs. Behind every head of long hair does not look a mind distorted by drugs. Some of the most thoughtful, studious, alert and eager minds belong to our sons and daughters. If they are to become participating members of the world, we must allow them to be apprentice adults and to feel some of the satisfying that make it worthwhile to become an adult. Otherwise, it's only natural they'll run away from unimaginable dangers. Certainly there are dangers. There have always been dangers. But one thing is certain. We cannot help our children if we meet the dangers with hysteria and lies. Lies we tell ourselves. Lies we tell to them. L.S.D. Now let's simmer down. Let's see what we can do. But what are you going to do, Dr. Wright? Dr. Wright! I had met with many such parent groups before, desperately seeking answers. When there was none, the anxiety grew intolerable and the defenses appeared. Most of them already knew the worst about LSD and were frightened. What they wanted to know was how could they get their children just as frightened? They began to describe to each other their frustrations at home in trying to get their children to listen to them. How can you study with all that noise? Daddy! It turns out the racket from downstairs. What did you say? Nothing. I'm trying to get this trig problem. I thought I told you to get a haircut. I had to study for this test. It's always something. Now let me tell you something. Bill has tuned his father out. And where do you think he learned how to do that? He learned it from you, Mr. Jones. From me? Well, not just from you, Mr. Jones. From all of us. We teach them to tune out when we don't listen to them. There's going to be a great big war. They're going to drop animals. Oh, we're going to have Look, to hide Look, I'm on the phone with Judy, you know. It's real. They're going to drop Tommy, your favorite they're TV they're program, they're John. They're Tommy we start going. teaching it to them very young. 
And we never stop. Excuse us, Miss Larson. Do you mind if we ask you a question about the assignment? Yes. Do you think that the writer's implication was that the character was dreaming the whole story? It's established in Chapter 6 that... She's tuned them out, involved with their appearance, not their problems. If nobody listens, not even at home, a kid can feel pretty lost. All that drivel they talk. You make them conceited if you hang in every word they say. Make them think whatever they say is important. What they say is important. Sometimes it might even be a cry for help. Those hippies are at it again. The police arrested eight more last night up on the strip. Oh, Daddy, you're always picking on them. Mary was there and she said they didn't do a thing. It was the police. And it says right here that um, alcohol does more harm to your nervous system. Well, the alcohol lobby doesn't want that known. Stop reading that underground trash and pay more attention to your homework. Oh, come on, darling. I never got good grades and I caught a husband. I'll call you later from the club, dear. Oh, what's the matter with you? Nothing. Can a person have any freedom around here? Freedom. Freedom? That's enough to frighten any parent. Her imagination is running wild. What does Nancy want? Just a minute. Are you going out barefooted? It's hot outside. I don't care what the temperature is. A young lady does not go out in public without her shoes. Nancy was testing. Not consciously, but needfully. She was seeking the freedom to make the small decisions in her life. To have a sense of her own self. Okay, I'll wear shoes. But you could worry about clothes for other reasons. Somewhere, Mrs. Porter had read that long sleeves were being worn to cover needle marks. When she thought about it, she hadn't seen Josh with bare arms for a long time. She felt both foolish and frightened, but she had to find out. Well, after all, parents are not immune to the anxieties of our age. What's the matter, Mom? Oh, nothing, honey. Good night. But what has happened to the avenues of communication that we must check up on our children in the dark by flashlight? Kids today have no manners, no sense of values. Half of them are long-haired drug addicts. You just have to listen to the news or read the papers to see it. Are you going to just listen to the news or are you going to listen to your kids? Dr. Wright, as much as I love Bill and Gina, I've got to say that they are rude and inconsiderate a lot of the time. And sloppy, too, especially Bill. What is it you want from them? Do you want to show them off like a new carpet in the living room? Are they just something else you own? Are they individuals, their very own selves, who need you for the very special purpose of teaching them how to become grown-ups? Well, I think that my children have sense enough to leave LSD alone. But how can I be sure when it's so available? One of the foremost authorities on LSD is Dr. J. Thomas Ungerleiter of the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute. I want you to hear what he has to say about it. I'd like to share some of my thoughts with you about LSD. The story, particularly of LSD, and also that of any of the drugs of abuse, is really a story of much more. It's a story of the two generations, of those under 30, often called teenagers, teeny boppers, adolescents, or whatever, and those over 30, those of us who are the establishment. For drug usage is a symptom. The story is that of adults' defensiveness, hysteria, scapegoating, frantic passing of laws, and real helplessness. It's also a story of youngsters' rebellion, gullibility, of adverse reactions, and felony and misdemeanor convictions. Tragically, the story has caused a tremendous failure in communication between the two generations, which has led to what we call a real generation gap. We've all been pretty helpless. Parents, schools, police, judges, doctors, hospitals, psychiatrists, ministers. There's no simple cause, like being too permissive or too strict or not caring for the kids, nor can one expect each parent to be a drug expert on many different drugs by reading all the literature and having all the right answers. No, no one's to blame. There's no simple answer. No school courses, movies, tranquilizers, nor laws to solve this problem. Rather, we must understand a couple of things about the adolescent. 
and perhaps that will lead us as well to even understanding some things about ourselves. Now, understanding doesn't mean that we'll be totally permissive. We'll certainly lay down some rules. But what we have to understand first is the adolescent struggles with his sexuality and his angry feelings. There's no time like adolescence where these struggles are more difficult and where one has to work harder to find one's identity in life. Drugs like LSD give the tragic illusion to the youngster that he has no struggles and no problems with sexuality and anger. He can pretend to himself that he doesn't have to explore the world inside himself and the world outside himself. Unfortunately, the youngster who's contemplating taking doesn't tell us about his hang-ups, as we call them, nor does any adolescent, but what he is to test us. He criticizes us and our society, the world we've created, and this leads to the second point that we must understand. This is the coexistence in the adolescence of extreme perceptivity and extreme gullibility. His gullibility makes the adolescent swallow the nonsensical hucksterings of any drug prophet who comes along. We could probably sell him Disneyland if we tried. On the other hand, it's his perceptivity which makes the adolescent seemingly such a problem for the rest of us. He criticizes what he sees as being imperfect in our world. And he sees things in the adult world that we would rather he didn't see. He sees the hypocrisies. He sees the stifling of the organization man's individuality. He sees our materialism and often shallow lives. Unfortunately, when he criticizes us, we get defensive. And this is where the generation gap really becomes so large. This is where we really turn off his listening to us. Sometimes we say all drug use is a giant communist plot. Sometimes we advocate censoring the radio stations that play rock and roll songs with words and ideas we don't like. Sometimes we frantically pass laws. But always we're defensive and not willing to admit that the youngster has to help us to create a better world instead of dropping out of the world as we know it with drugs. But adolescence is a time of paradoxes. These kids actually want us to retain control of the home, the classroom, and the campus, and not to panic or to be totally permissive. They want to know our ideas, but they don't say, for example, tell me about alcoholism. What the adolescent says instead to test us is something like, alcohol is worse than LSD. Then he watches our reaction. It's so important to let the youngster explore new ideas, for ideas and even rebellion can be good but not the drug rebellion. Of course, these kids have us in a vulnerable position. We're a drug culture. That's the message at the beginning of the film. It's such a fundamental hypocrisy when we adults tell the youngsters that our drugs, our barbiturates, tranquilizers, and especially alcohol, are good drugs, and that it's their marijuana and LSD that are the bad drugs. What can we do? First of all, I think it's vital that we let people talk about drugs in the schools and at home, because to make talking about drugs forbidden is to make it very exciting. Indeed, I've talked to youngsters who take drugs who would rather be drinking alcohol because they like the effects of alcohol better. But when they're taking the forbidden drugs, they're thinking to themselves, what would mom think if she knew? What would teach think? Whereas they know if they're drinking alcohol and their teacher or parent found out, they'd probably just laugh and say, well, so what? We all drink too. Some of the schools that won't discuss drugs have the worst drug problems. Others, where their minor drug problems, treat it like any other of society's difficult problem areas by discussing drugs, not preaching, but letting the youngsters form their ideas based on knowledge. An honest I don't know is okay to tell a kid, but not the big lie. We often rationalize the big lie by saying that it's for the youngster's own good. So, with LSD, we talk of deformed babies, unproven, to scare them. But that's what they don't buy. But let's face it, we can't equate the danger of a youngster rebelling with a very dangerous drug like LSD with the danger to him of long hair, even though we may not like long hair because we can't tell the boys from the girls. And when we read in the paper about a sensational story that this or that drug is either instant happiness or instant death, let's keep our cool, as the kids say. Let's not get uptight, or let's be from Missouri, meaning let's be very skeptical and let's go after the real facts. 
LSD lets simmer down. We have to remember, above all, that the adolescents are struggling with their feelings of aggression and sexuality, along with the need to establish an identity. They are rebelling and experimenting sexually, trying to find out who they want to be like, what they want to become as they grow older. Many of them see LSD as offering a magic solution for these struggles. But because the drug helps the adolescent to pretend to himself that he's not rebellious or angry, nor has any sexual needs, it deprives him of the chance to work out his problems at the most crucial time of life. This is the greatest tragedy from LSD. Man's search for El Dorado in a pill continues. LSD will surely become obsolete as other more potent psychedelics are developed. As Dr. Ungerleiter has said, people need to explore their feelings and talk out their reactions. People make us feel so self-conscious about our teenagers. Why, we worry more about what the neighbors have to say than about what's good for our kids. You sound like a hippie, accusing us of saying one thing and meaning another. Ah, uh, but adolescents have always criticized the world their parents made. If you criticize a thing, you don't have to admit you're afraid to grow up and become a part of it. On the other hand, much of their criticism shows honesty and mature perception. They seem to be both childish and wise at the same time. Instead of defending our world, perhaps we ought to invite them in to improve it. Does that mean they can do anything they like? No. Just listen to them. If we listen, if we really listen, if we listen right now when it's important to them, not later on when you've read the papers or when we've washed the dishes or maybe had a minute, if we give them the same respect we'd give a passing stranger, we might be able to get them to return that respect and the interest. We might even get them to hear what we're saying. But what? What are we supposed to say to them? No one can tell you for sure what to say. Every individual is different. Every family knows for itself what's gone on before. But we, we don't even remember what we've done wrong. You don't have to remember. There are all the pressures of the outside world, all the pressures of his inner changing adolescent self. Try to concentrate on keeping the channels of communication open. Most kids are essentially moral. They think a great deal about who they are and where they're going. Is a psychedelic trip really worth risking the damage to your minds and your bodies? Well, how do you know, Mom? You've never experienced it. You've never been there. Well, I don't have to have syphilis to know I don't want it. What they crave is our honesty. Well, what about LSD? Lately, the new research has shown that it may affect your unborn children. Do you know that for a fact? No, I really don't. But why take a chance? You know, there's all sorts of jobs going on in research and investigations about LSD. Why not get on that side of the fence instead of being the guinea pigs? Oh, come on, Mom. Calling Dr. Kill there. Keep your cool. They heard you. Give the thoughts time to germinate. Growing up isn't easy, but we can help by setting reasonable rules that the kids can help to formulate. Since time began, the snake has been symbolic of evil, destruction, death. Out of the slime and darkness it comes to inflict its life-destroying poison on the careless, the unwary, the unprotected. No sane person would deliberately expose himself to its venom. No intelligent person would venture within striking distance of its fangs. Yet today, thousands of young people are flirting with a poison every bit as deadly as that of the snake. aren't too good. Unless he pulls them up, he can be put off the teeth. A normal enough problem with a normal enough solution. Hit the books a little harder, get a little help, and pull them up. 
He will mean giving up some fun and weekends, but he knows he can do it. If necessary, he can cram a few days before the exam and even pep himself up on Benny's. He handled them before, and he knows where to draw the line. He knows he'll never go beyond that step. But someone else knows John has taken his first step toward drugs. Someone who is willing to help him take the second and the third and the fourth steps where eventually he becomes a member of that tight society of drug addicts. To John, it seems perfectly natural and innocent to bump into an old classmate. He hasn't seen Pete since he dropped out of school last year. From the looks of him, he seems to be doing well on his out-of-town selling job. What John doesn't know is the selling job is pushing dope, and the long absence from town was spent in the state prison. Their accidental meeting calls for a little celebration, and Pete has just the thing. There's a little private party going on tonight, plenty of fun and laughs. Take a break from the books and live a little. It sounds good, but today's his father's day off, and John needs his help with some school problems. If there's another party sometime, maybe he'll make it then. But Pete isn't interested in some time, or maybe, or squares. If you want to swing, call him. Right now, he's got to split. He's got to find fish ready to be hooked. Victims to supply him with money for the heroin he needs today and tomorrow and tomorrow. Compared to Pete's problems, John's are nothing. Poor grades, expulsion from the team, the frustrations and responsibilities of growing up seem important only to himself. All he needs is a little help, a little guidance, a little understanding. But the help, the guidance, the understanding are not there when he needs it. His parents are away just when he was counting on them to be home. His problems must wait for tomorrow, or he can solve them tonight alone. Only he can go just so far alone. During his childhood, he was loved, helped, protected. Suddenly, that's all gone. Now he's in a man's body, he's expected to be a man, to stand alone on his own two feet. This he will gladly do, but he needs a little push. He needs someone to help him over the hump of schoolwork that's troubling him. Today, he's had it. The studies can wait until tomorrow. He knows he can finish them then, what he doesn't know is behavior habits formed long ago are now taking over. The practice of putting things off, making excuses, shirking unpleasant tasks is strongly etched in his character. It's Saturday night and everyone else is out having fun. It's the best excuse in the world to join the party. party is swinging. Just the thing he needs to pep him up. The stage is set, the principal players are in position, the curtain is up. John doesn't realize it, but he has just been cast as the star fall guy in a real life tragedy. <laughs> Thank you. 
the excitement of Helen and several beers have taken effect. Inhibition and caution are forgotten. When Helen suggests they have a few more beers, he's all for it. Why not? Everyone else is doing it. To refuse would be square, and that terrible label must be avoided at all costs. Besides, he's never been high on it before, and he never will. He can handle the stuff. The only trouble is he can't handle so much. Under the influence of the beer, Helen comes through as much more friendly. He's flattered by her attentions and her interest in him. If he could see her arms, scarred by the needle marks, he would know she's a hype. If he could see her police record, he would know she works for Pete. Pete and Helen know their parts well. They've been through it before, and they know the time is right. Throw out the sucker bait. It's time for the next step. The next step is the garage. There, some of the gang are really blasting. That's where the real action is. Come on and take a look. Take a trip from Squaresville. Live a little and see what it's like for yourself. The senses are dulled just enough to be reckless. Helen, the music, the beer, the promise of excitement press in on him. Now, curiosity has to be satisfied. And why not? It can't do any harm to look. The trippers, the grasshoppers, the hip ones, all gathered in secrecy and flying high as a kite. Outside the boundaries of their phony world of kicks is the ever-present possibility of discovery. This must be avoided at all costs, for discovery brings with it the penalties of society. Shame, arrest, prison. So destroy the evidence, leave not a trace, burn it in paper trash. That way they can deny possessing the illegal marijuana. They can say the flaming can is part of a game. They can lie, they can swear. This time the gang's lucky. It's not the law, or discovery, or problems. It's just their supplier, Pete, with his number one chick, and a new guy looking for kicks. Forget it, man, and get with the countdown. Shake this square world and blast off for Kicksville. To John, his first pot party looks exciting. Everyone seems to be having fun. Best of all, there are no parents, no other adults, no one to interfere with the fun. The feeling of importance, of belonging, of putting one over is taking hold. Pete intends to tighten that hold, to squeeze it, to hook it, to lock it in, not introduce the joints. But Pete has learned the rules well. A pusher can never be caught with the stuff on him. Instead, he must leave it, stash it, get it from a flunky. This is the test, the time to separate the man from the boy. John's willpower, individuality, character are slipping down the drain. In their place come the old behavior habits and excuses. Everybody else is doing it. If he can handle bennies and beer, he should be able to handle a few harmless puffs just to see what it's like. The natural defenses are crumbling. The barriers of caution are beaten down. Drag it, man. Try anything once. Fly. You can't get a habit from weed. Quit whenever you like. Don't be chicken.
Come on, man. Get with it. Under the proddings of the gang, the effects of the atmosphere and beer, the desire to belong, he chooses to go along. John surrenders his dignity and lays his future on the chopping block. Not whether it's good or bad or right or wrong. But if he stopped to think, he would see the stupidity of it all. Now he's too involved to think. He's having kicks. He's away and flying. Up, up, out of this world. But everything that goes up must come down. When John came down, he landed with a thud. Due to the effects of the alcohol and the late hours at the party, the following day he was too tired, too sick to study. Now, facing another school day, he finds the same problems, the same responsibilities are still with him. As well as arguments, traffic violations. And as the days go by, he looks for more kicks, more escape from the troubles he brings on himself. Each time he feels the need for kicks or he's troubled, he returns to marijuana. He knows that marijuana isn't physically addicting. He doesn't know he's become psychologically dependent on it. But he's not worried. He knows he can handle it. In time, the continued use of marijuana causes psychic and physiological changes in his body. While under the influence of marijuana, his blood pressure increases. He feels unusual hunger and his central nervous system changes. His perception of depth and dimensions is radically changed. A low curb appears as a precipice. With a distortion of sight and sound, time is suspended. Fast action appears slow. The whole world is distorted. When the big blow comes, the world caves in. Being put off the team leaves him angry, resentful, humiliated. He's sinking into the pit of despair, and he needs help to pull himself out. But where should he look for it? Whom should he ask? The coach won't give him a break. The teacher? Ah, he's already failed him, so why keep on with studies? His parents? They don't understand anything. Religion? What a laugh that would give the gang. Those resources and others are available to him, but he thinks only a pal can help. Help split this square world. Help him forget everything and everybody. He's been dragging the weed now long enough to want to try a bigger kick. In his present frame of mind, the bigger, the better. Psychologically, he's ready to make the big C. His pals have introduced new props and he's anxious to examine them. Caution, intelligence, normal defenses go up in pot smoke. Hank is a real hype, a hooked mainliner beyond hope. He is long past getting any kicks from marijuana. His body is conditioned to heroin, one of the most powerful, dangerous drugs known to man. So dangerous that its importation, even for medical uses, has been banned in the United States since 1925. Every day, the cost of his habit rises. $80, $90, $100 a day and more. Every day, he must have increasing amounts of the drug. To get it, he will lie, steal, murder, even trap the innocent. The outfit that he uses is the drug addict's only friend. With it, he can exist in his living hell until the next fix. Without it, he will suffer the unbearable tortures of withdrawal from the drug. To prepare the venom for his bloodstream, he empties heroin onto the spoon. Every grain is precious and cannot be spilled or wasted. A few drops of water are added to make a solution.
Then the small wad of cotton, usually dirty, is placed on the spoon to serve as a filter. The solution is then drawn through the cotton filter and into the needle. This cotton is saved and used again and again, for if the addict is ever caught without the drug, he can cook the cottons and squeeze out a small amount. This is it then, the big time, the main line, the high point of every drug addict's existence. Of every thousand hikes who ride the toboggan to hell, only a few ever get off. Of course, Pete is careful not to let John see the actual needle pop. That is hidden, ignored, bypassed. Instead, only the fun, the kicks, the real blast is played up. The tourniquet is quickly tied and secured. The vein is enlarged. The hype is ready. All sanitary precautions are ignored and normal hygiene protections are out. All addicts run the risk of infecting themselves with tetanus, hepatitis, venereal, and other diseases. But in a race with time to stop withdrawal, he doesn't think of such things. Right now, all that matters is the dirty needle, the germ-infested cotton, the poisonous drug. By now, John is psychologically ready for stronger drugs. To his confused brain, the idea of joining Hank in a bigger kick is highly enticing. It would be all right to try it just once, just to see what it's really like. The only thing is the ugly looking needle, the vague uncertain fear of maybe getting hooked. His pal laughs at his fear of a little needle. A small pop doesn't hurt. It only makes you fly. Besides, only squares get hooked. The hip guys are just occasional users. You blast every once in a while and quit whenever you like. A few pops now and then can't possibly hurt. The idea of a real kick without getting hooked takes hold. John isn't afraid and he certainly isn't square. The chain reaction has reached the end of the line. He's handled alcohol, goofballs, marijuana. Now he's positive he can handle one little pop. But something seems to have gone wrong. The excuse of it can't happen to me was all right for the first pop and the second and the third. But the more heroin he shoots, the more tolerance his body builds and the more he needs. He needs a shot now and he needs it badly. But this is the last one. After he's feeling better, he'll quit. Never touch the stuff again. <gasps> At first, it all seemed like such harmless fun. It was hit to go along with the gang. But where's the gang now? Why aren't they with him when he needs them most? Too late, he realizes that by joining to belong, he's more alone than ever. This is the one trip he must take all alone. Only he himself can experience the unbearable agony of withdrawal. Alternately, he will feel chills and burnings. Violent muscular cramps will rack his tortured body. He will vomit and then retch in uncontrollable convulsions. The agony will reach its peak in 36 to 72 hours, then continue for two more weeks. In the meantime, he must obey the rules of the drug addict's world of secrecy. His screams of pain can bring discovery. Worst of all, they can bring the law and force of the hell just had. Oh, cool it, cut it, strangle it. In the jungle land of narcotics, it's fight, claw, kill, and every man for himself. The demons of withdrawal pains have increased their torture. They run rampant through his body and prepare to multiply themselves hundreds of times again. Ironically, the only relief from his demons is through the very poison that originally hooked him. The same heroin that will bind him ever more tightly to his living hell. But the blessed temporary delivery is not given through any noble charitable motives. It's just the final step in Pete's carefully laid plan. He's made another junkie and another source of money. 
Now with the hook in deep, he twists it to make sure the victim will never get away. Now that John has experienced the horrors of withdrawal, he will make sure he gets his junk every day. His pal Pete will be glad to supply him, but only for money, plenty of money. For in the vicious racket that preys on human misery, there is no trust, no credit, no mercy. It's cash on the line for the unbearable agony of withdrawal. But the infected victims still go on. With a police record to haunt him as long as he lives, John uses the leniency of the law sometimes allowed first offenders. So, he enters a government hospital for the very best treatment modern science can give. Months later, the agony of withdrawals, the care, the treatments are behind him. Now that he's kicked the habit, he can try to pick up the pieces of his broken life. I wonder if Pete and Hank are out of prison yet. It won't do any harm to stop by and just say hello. quite a few at the strip, and he's getting better. Uh, can I have the handle, or do you expect me to hit it with my finger? <laughs> Tracing and pat out two most important in his life. Thank you. How's it going, George? Well, I expect to be done at noon in about a week. <laughs> Tell me again, George, to win the national. Huh? We're going to blow them off, man. Those other shoes won't even know what hit them. When the lights come down, it's going to be to the floor and whale. And Big Bad Willis is going to do it. To what do you attribute your success to Mr. Big Bad Willis? Split-second timing, fantastic reflexes, a keen eye. And... <laughs> is that all? Hmm, pretty foxy mechanic. Hey, it's Tony Nancy. Hi, George. Hi there. Hi, Pat. Hi, Tony. How's everything going? Pretty good. How's the digger coming? Out of sight, shaping up. Uh, say, that idea about the cam was good. How about trying it this Sunday? Sure, fine. What else you been doing this little flower? Well, I changed it from a 3.9 to a 4.10, and I moved my controls in so I can uh, you know, grab them quicker. Mm -hmm. And I changed the uh, brake from a uh, pull operated to a push operated. I think that'll be a lot easier. To As captain of the United States drag racing team, Tony Nancy has toured all over the world, taking on all challengers. Typical of the kind of guy that's really into drag racing. Tony unselfishly shares his years of experience and technical knowledge. Yeah, yeah, especially with George, who has proven his ability as a driver and won enough prize money to build his own dragster. The big thing in the air is the upcoming Winter Nationals. George will be driving a sponsored double-A fueler and could win more than enough to finish his own machine. Yeah, it looks like magnesium that you've made that whole yeah. thing out of. Oh, that'd be nice and light and strong. Well, I've got a lot of things to do. Can I count on you being out of the strip side? Sure, cousin. Anderson is a different sort of guy. He doesn't have many friends his own age. He seems to feel more secure with people several years younger than himself. He buys and sells marijuana. Max doesn't understand the kind of hard work and concentration George has put into building his dragster. But then he doesn't understand what it means to have a commitment to something. Potheads seem to have one thing in common. The belief that work and serious thought are a drag. I was wondering if you can lay a couple numbers on it. Oh, it's been kind of low lately. I don't know. Um, I'll have to
to check with the man. Until recently, oh, George has smoked here. marijuana only occasionally, oh, yeah, no just to be sociable. Later, uh, but for some reason, he's starting to buy, and that's a whole new scene. pretty good all the way. I think we're on the right track here. Uh, incidentally, I didn't want to say anything yesterday with Pat there, but uh, I hear you've been blowing smoke too. What do you mean? I mean like grass. Who told you this? I don't get up tight. I'm just telling you that I don't want to know anything about it one way or the other. Only alcohol, pills, dope, none of that stuff makes it, pal. You don't need it here. This is no toy. It's got 1,500 horsepower, puts out 8,000 RPM. You've seen it, George. You've seen guys blow up just for one goofy mistake. We don't need any fuzzy-headed guys who feel beautiful inside and end up dead outside. I've seen some of your friends. I wouldn't let them come five feet of this car. This is real. You're going to have to choose. Man, I really resent that. You think I'm some kind of dope fiend or something. I don't go around having withdrawals or go out of my head and kill people. Man, that's somebody else's trip. George is gradually assuming the role of a regular user. He feels he can handle marijuana and resents being challenged. Because booze, the same people who are giving out the lectures are going home and they start belting on martinis. Or they take a pill to put themselves to sleep and a pill to diet on. Everyone's entitled to their own trip. The choice is not really between alcohol, pills, or marijuana. The choice is whether or not you want to be dependent on any of them. Most people stay away from drugs of any kind for fear of the unknown. With marijuana, a hallucinogen, there is good reason for fear. Not everybody, George. I think Tony is right. I'd really be afraid to try it. Winner is George Willis, turned in a 667, 215.82 miles per hour in this afternoon's final elimination round for double-A viewers here at the beach. This makes it three in a row for Willis, an 18-year-old rookie driver from Redondo Beach, California. He picks up $500 in prize money for the number one bracket and qualifies for tomorrow's annual Far West Championship. Be sure to be on hand. Tomorrow at 1.30, the action begins. And if, if anybody can drive, George can drive. The guy's leaving. Yeah, he's fantastic. Out of... Hey, George! Hey, George! Hey, George! Throughout the nation, marijuana has become a major problem. It has been the cause for many police records on otherwise law-abiding young people. Do you think there's any possibility of you bailing me out of here? Well, man, you're lucky because I won $500 today. Top eliminator. That's great. Let's celebrate. Um, as soon as you get me out of here, let's go to my place and we'll have a party. Okay, out of sight. Hey, listen, where are you right now? Uh, Inglewood Police Department. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm gonna go see a bail bondsman, and I'll be right down. I'll have you out in no time. Hey, Groot. Thank you. Well, at least I know some of them. Go on in, make yourself at home, and I'll be right with you. George, I don't know. No, Pat. 
We've got to get together on this. We're celebrating, remember? Yeah, but... You can't possibly know anything about it unless you try it. Pisces, you know. Water people. We're kind of special. Oh, here, let me lay a number on you. You have a roach clip? Yeah, here you go. I'll uh, sit on here and do our number. Now, the object is to get all that smoke into your lungs and as much as you can and hold it just for as long as you can. Do I tell you we need a warning? Now, come on. It won't hurt to try. I mean, Take it. You can never tell if marijuana will hurt you. It is inconsistent and it unpredictable. In, it Take it all some down. grass may be weak and hand. some very strong. And each person will react differently to the same batch. <coughs> nah, you'll get better. What's the effect on it? Well, just take a few more totes off this and you can find out. Keep going. Oh, come on. Most pot smokers feel compelled to turn others on and will exert pressure on their closest friends. Anyone who does not share his fascination of getting stoned is an outsider. That isn't that bad. Just take the joint and get it all into your lungs. Marijuana's immediate good system. The stronger the grass, the greater the distortion of perception and judgment. Depending on the personality and mood of the user, illusions or hallucinations may occur. Sights and sounds are exaggerated. Associations may be disorganized, and time and space relationships are lost. Just the opposite. Great anxiety. You are not yourself. You are not in control. All right, that's it. You want wine next summer? Yeah. The whole summer. At a critical time when young people must make decisions that will shape their future, the people who become dependent upon marijuana are dependent on an escape that makes the unreal seem beautiful and the reality of life seem unnecessary. Now, Pad, wake up. Come on, Pad. It's no time to crash. We're going to get some munchies. Come on. Well, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Look, George, Pat's still pretty drowsy. She can come with me and lie down in the back of the bus. Hunger and thirst are common side effects to smoking pot, and frequently the users will drive a car before his reflexes have returned to normal.
despite a drastic loss of judgment, the user has a false sense of self-confidence. The driver's awareness and perception are altered, particularly as they relate to time and space. He may be traveling at a comfortable 20 miles an hour and feel no need to slow down to turn a sharp corner. He may become hung up on a visual experience or a physical activity totally unrelated to driving. Hurry up! If anybody's holding, start eating it right now. I wouldn't let him come five feet of this car. This is real. Take it down in deep. You're going to have to choose. What's the effect on it? Oh, take it. Take it. Take it. A few more tugs off this. Find out. Come on. Hold it in. Take it all the way down. This is real. You're going to have to choose. Real. This is real. You're going to have to choose. This is real. You're going to have to choose. Decisions regarding marijuana, there's no mystery about it. great inner revelation. It's a simple distortion, a great escape. Timing, fantastic reflexes, a keen eye, and a cool head. <laughs> 
Dose of cocaine causes convulsions, then death. Government agencies charged with the enforcement of narcotics laws have been able until recently to decrease steadily the number of addicts in the United States. These addicts have included persons in every walk of life. Some are petty criminals who will remain drug addicts all their lives. Many addicts come from teeming slum areas where human misery runs high. But the grim specters of heroin, marijuana, and cocaine are not confined to any area or to any group. Wherever there is a troubled personality, no matter how hidden or unrecognized, there may be a seedbed for drug addiction. So unpredictable is this habit that occasionally even one who knows the dangers may come addicted before he realizes it. Sometimes the addict may come from a wealthy family, where drugs respect neither riches nor poverty. Such a victim doesn't have to steal to support his expensive habit, but the degrading effects are the same. In recent increase in drug addiction among young people, often in their teens, who take up the habit without the slightest understanding of the living nightmare 
they are so unthinkingly walking into. To get the illegal drugs, they are forced to deal with criminals who prey on those least able to defend themselves. And to find money for their expensive habit, they... envelope with six caps in it. There's a chemical lab report on it. It's heroin. What do you have to say, Demelon? Let's see your arms. How long have you been taking heroin? Well, I... Speak up. About two years, I guess. What about before then? Well, I smoked marijuana for a while. How long? Four or five months, I guess. How did you get started on this? Well, I don't know. A friend of mine, well, he started me. Started by a friend. An oft-told story. For drug addiction is contagious. One addict can make, can make 20 of it. Marty's story is like many of the others. It started two years ago with marijuana cigarettes. Come on, it's my turn next. Gee, Duke, where'd you get them? I, uh... I know a guy. Three for a buck. Let me try. Gee. I, I feel awful funny. Me too. I feel kind of sick. Come on, Marty. Pass it on. Marty got kind of sick too. But he wouldn't let on. He was determined to be one of the gang if it killed him. And it almost did. Several weeks later, after smoking reefers, Marty's befogged brain hit on a clever way to open pop bottles. Later, Stan went to the hospital for swallowing broken glass. Marty badly cut the inside of his mouth, though he didn't even know it at the time. Duke was the one who got Marty on the habit. It was just a business matter to Duke, Though Marty didn't find it out till later. Hey, Marty. Here. Okay, here. What's that? H. H. What's H? That's a lot. It's heroin. Will it make me sick like the reefers did? Go on and try it. I dare you. How much does it cost? This one ain't gonna cost you nothing. It's free. Go on. I dare you. In his ignorance, Marty took that dare, little knowing the eventual horror that lay in the deadly white powder. Those first capsules were free. But when Marty started asking for them, the price came high, a dollar and a half a piece. That's right, kid. Fifteen bucks. You thought I'd hold me for a while. I hocked my camera to get this, though. Where's my cut? You don't get one. This kid's hooked. Go out and get some new kids if you want a cut. Well, he's still snorting it. So what? Snorting or mainlining? What's the difference? He's hooked. Hey, look, look, I, I, I gotta have my cut. It's cost me more than ever now that I'm on speedball. That cocaine cure problem, kid. So, you're snorting it, huh? Yeah. Well, don't be a sucker. You're wasting it that way. Use a needle. Is that what you do, Louis? Sure. Like I'm doing it, see? Mainlining it. it does cost too much to waste it. Kid, you ought to go on the needle. Nah, I don't want to punch myself full of holes like that. But he did use the needle, despite his fear of it. At first, he shot the drug under his skin, then directly into the vein. As his body gradually built up a tolerance, he needed more and more of the drug. There was no pleasure in it for Marty. It was a bodily demand. He was using four or five caps a day now. They cost him seven and a half dollars, fifty-two fifty a week. It was more than his salary at the store could pay for. He thought old Barston would never miss a few things here and there.
but he was wrong. Barston didn't prosecute, but Marty no longer had a job. Drugs were becoming Marty's whole life. He was abnormally sleepy, losing weight, cross, irritable, fearful that the puncture marks on his arms would be discovered. His former friends now let him strictly alone. But with a false sense of loyalty, they didn't report him to the authorities. They would have done him a favor if they had. Left from Marty were other drug addicts like Duke. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered but the ever-present craving for the drugs. He had given up interest in everything else. Marty's family saw all of these symptoms and others too, but didn't understand them. Often in the morning, his pillow would be wet from perspiration. His mother knew something was wrong. Something. Marty, have you seen the pinking shears I bought last week? I find them anywhere. How should I know, Mom? Marty, you don't seem right, son. I'm worried about you. I'm all right, Mom. Just leave me alone. There's something wrong. I'm going to take you down to Dr. Bleeker's this afternoon for a checkup. No. No, I'm all right. Well, don't act like that. I don't know what it could be. Ever since you lost that job at Mr. Boston. I don't know. I'm all right, Mom. I'll snap out of it. I hope so. You've lost weight. You don't have dates. You don't go out with the fellas anymore like you used to. There's something wrong. I know there must be. Well, boys go through all kinds of stages. Dr. Bleeker can tell us if there's anything wrong. I hope it isn't anything serious. Marty! Marty! Marty was hooked. Physically dependent on heroin. When he was without the white powder too long, his whole body revolted in dreadful protest. Sweat poured from him. He got the shakes. He had cold chills. His nose ran and his eyes ran. He was doubled up by piercing cramps, plagued by sudden attacks of vomiting and of diarrhea. Nothing could stop these attacks, but more of the white drug in his veins. All right, kid. Beat him. I don't want you hanging around here. Okay, okay, give me a chair. Hitting it tough, huh? None of your business. Okay. That's the way you feel about it? I was just trying to help you out, that's all. Yeah. You wouldn't help your mother out of a rat hole. How would you like to make a fast couple of bucks? Doing what? Oh, it's easy. Nothing to it. I could use some new customers. Customers? You mean suckers. I'll give you the same cut I gave Duke. What happened to him? Oh, he's brought in everybody he knows. I gotta branch out. Well, I... I could use the dough at that. Fine. Shut him out on reefers. It's easier that way, and it's cheaper. Yeah, that's the way I started. You got him? Sure. For you, two bits a piece. Well, give me two for now. That's all the dough I got. Right now. So, Marty went out to spread his contagion. And Louie? Well, it was just business to him. The capsules of heroin, so necessary to Marty, were only so much stock to Louis. That stock had reached him through a series of well-organized underworld transactions. Some months back, smuggled ashore in a box of fresh-caught fish, were a number of small tubes of pure heroin, a kilogram in all, a little more than two pounds. Originally bought for $1,000, it was resold after being smuggled into this country for $7,000. It was mixed with a similar looking white powder, milk sugar, and sold again for $30,000. These were big business transactions possible only by organized criminal syndicates. Many believe such syndicates in a cold-blooded scheme to create a market for their drugs are directly responsible for the sudden growth of drug addiction among young people. By the time Louis Legty got it, the heroin had been cut many times, passed through many hands for investment. Big stakes, worth taking a few chances for, especially when pusher Louis would take the rap. But even Louis wasn't taking much of a chance. He had junkies, dope addicts, working for him, like Marty Demelon. 
Marty had to keep going somehow to bring in the daily flow of money necessary to keep his habit supplied with drugs. When there were no new customers for Louie, Marty worked at any job he could find. But the jobs didn't last long. Often he had to turn to petty thieving and shoplifting to get the money he so desperately needed. Before long, he became fairly well known to the police. Mrs. Demelon, do you have anything to say? Yes, Judge. Marty, he isn't a bad boy. I wish you could have seen him before he started this poison. He always made good grades at school. He was doing so well at Mr. Barston's grocery. Judge, he's a good boy. I understand. Demelon, I believe you acquired the drug habit through ignorance. If you knew then what you know now, you probably never would have touched that first marijuana cigarette. Well, there's no way of undoing it now. I'm going to set you to one year in the municipal jail. However, I'll suspend sentence if you're willing to be committed to a hospital for the treatment of drug addicts and stay there until medically discharged. You mean to try to kick the habit? That's right. They know how to get you over the physical dependence with the least amount of withdrawal sickness. Do you agree? Yes, sir. All right, so ordered. Next case. For those already addicted to drugs, the first step in rehabilitation must be commitment to a hospital where they will be under medical guidance. For the addict willing to be committed or sent by the courts, there are federally operated hospitals. Adequate local hospitals would help to cope with this problem. The treatment itself lasts for months, but withdrawing the drug takes a comparatively short time. The major problem is helping the addict achieve a workable psychological adjustment to life, a life which doesn't include drugs. It's a difficult procedure. No hospital, no doctor can be sure of success in trying to change long-time attitudes. Back in his old haunts, the former addict still finds himself shunned by all but the addicts and peddlers who were his associates before. For effective treatment, there must be a long-term, community-wide program to help the former addict and his family make an adjustment. Beat it, Duke. I want no part of you. Ah, don't be a square. What's it getting you? I don't know yet, Duke. I took plenty to kick the habit. It's my chance, and I'm taking it. A chance? <laughs> you ain't got no chance. They're just a junkie to everybody around here. I know, I know. But they helped me get a job in here. And they went to see Ma. And the doc says that if the I... The doc says? What does he know? Listen, I'm telling you... No, I'll cut it. Against such pressures, local outpatient clinics, social agencies, the church, all are needed if drug addicts are to adjust to a new life. Without intensive effort by all community forces, very few drug addicts can ever expect to return to a normal, useful life in society. It is important in the overall problem of drug addiction to do everything possible to stop the sale of the drugs. One step would be to increase the staff of enforcement agencies, not only federal, but state and municipal agencies too. Criminal syndicates might give up drug traffic entirely if nationwide laws provided for stringent penalties to counteract the tremendous profits, and if these laws were energetically enforced. Certainly such laws would restrict the actions of non-addict peddlers like Louis Lechte and make it harder for him to reach his victims. Basic to everything else is a wider knowledge especially among young people, of the grave danger involved in any kind of experimentation with drugs. They should understand the thoughtless curiosity about what it feels like to smoke marijuana or take a shot of heroin can lead to a lifetime of pain and torment, constantly faced by the horror of being without drugs. Much can be done to stamp out this vicious practice if each person who knows of a drug peddler or a drug addict reports him to the authorities immediately as a deadly menace to himself. For every person must take some of the responsibility for preventing the growth of drug addiction. He must face the possibility that he himself may be a potential drug addict. 
Only by avoiding these drugs sure that he will remain forever, which enslaves not only one's body, but the soul as well. Thank you.